Do they have any effect on the quantum system? If they interact with the, with the atoms in the crystal. Yeah. I imagine in the most case they, they just tend to pass through yeah. things. So, But if there was an interaction, say a, a cosmic ray or something yeah. could knock an electron out of an atom, that could contribute towards it, something like that. So here's just an example showing you this, uh, again, this measurement that you make to check how long the qubits are working for. This is using a particular type of material, silicon nitride, and this is another qubit made using silicon oxide. You can just see the difference, really, between these two materials. So it's very, very important that we look at the materials. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the applications of, that quantum computers could potentially be used for if we can get them to work. So the idea is that quantum computers may or may not be able to solve NP-complete problems faster than classical computers. Now this is like still quite a hotly debated topic, so no one really knows the answer to this, but there's quite a lot of evidence that they might be able to. For example, the algorithms I discussed before look as though they're able to solve these problems faster, but then when you actually implement them, there might be some reason that you know it just you just can't get it to work. So this is why we need to build these systems to find if we can actually implement these algorithms on them. And you'll find if you look, there are NP-complete problems everywhere. And so the thing about an NP-complete problem is as your, as your number of variables or your problem size scales up, it gets exponentially more difficult to calculate the, um, the correct answers. It's like what Dave was saying with the <coughs> chessboard. Calculating moves, potential moves in a chess game just becomes completely impossible beyond one or two steps. So you're saying that quantum computers can look like even better chess than a yes. classical <laughs> computer because you can look at all the different options and yeah. parallel yeah. and that's say, oh, this one gets a checkmate, so that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you could find an algorithm that could encode in a way of, of telling a move was good, then then that would um, then that would be that would work. Okay, so here are some applications. So first in the engineering area, you can do things like circuit routing, for example. So circuit routing is just a minimum, an energy minimization problem. You're looking for the uh, best way of placing the tracks on a circuit board subject to certain constraints. So like they can only go around corners at certain angles, they can, they can only cross other tracks a certain number of times. When you put all these constraints into the problem, you find that it maps onto this energy minimization problem. So, yeah. I was just going to say, basically, the great thing that hopefully they actually get in from modern computers and doing this kind of technology is that the system bootstraps. If you can get a quantum computer doing circuit routing and ASIC design, then you can use that quantum computer to design the next quantum computer. Mm. And hopefully, well, you, you basically go from first generation to second generation to third generation at Moore's Law speeds yeah. in quantum yeah. computing. But it's a bit like the same Moore's Law. We, it was 20, 30 years, 40 years with valves before the first valve computers were used to design the first transistors. Mm -hmm. and things yeah. came so I think this is kind of the law of accelerating returns. Like well, I can I tell you the number of process farms that we use purely for ASIC design. Mm -hmm. and so the, um, again, things like product and component placement on circuit boards is the same problem, and not, not just on circuit boards either, but this, this problem in general of where to put things in the optimal uh, configuration, things like seating plans and all of the kind of uh, management problems. Um, anything that involves a travelling salesman type problem, um, this is finding the uh, best route between cities essentially is the original problem, the, the shortest distance while still visiting every city only once. So anything you can think of in this area. So things like network routing, for example, is another, another one, finding the um, best configuration for this. And also things like traffic and congestion simulation, when you're trying to put in a new road, you want to see how that will affect all the other roads in the nearby vicinity. And again, this maps onto the same type of problem. Um, there are some interesting um, applications in biology and genetics. So things like um, metabolic pathways and um, metabolites. So what, what you generally find is when you're looking at processes that go on within the body, 
they're very, very complicated and we can only get a tiny fraction of the data out um, by taking things like samples and looking at what metabolites are present. You're trying to work out what that metabolite, which process it's involved in. And so there are lots of databases available with just loads and loads of information on these, these different pathways. And so actually searching and matching within these databases is something that quantum computers could potentially do much faster. Um, and things like um, bioinformatics as well. So anything where you've got a large set of data and you're trying to search or match or, or um, manipulate it. Um, again, so things like protein folding is quite an interesting one because this is one where you can actually simulate a system as it folds because the, um, the things that cause proteins to fold involve quantum interactions between the individual molecules. So, Do you know how many qubits you'd need to actually do a, a practical protein fold, solve a protein folding problem? Um, it depends on the size of the protein, yeah, but sure, I was imagining you could probably do it with something like a few qubits to represent each physical molecule because it will have several de degrees of freedom and the qubit only has um, two, so, two, two states. So you could probably do it with a few qubits per molecule. And how many molecules are on a protein? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one small one. <laughs> do, you, do you mean how many atoms on the protein? Now? Yes, sorry, yeah. 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 the individual yeah. atoms. So the idea is that you can actually simulate individual atoms and how they interact with other atoms um, using a, a quantum computer and therefore you can potentially... So we're tens of thousands here? I, I would think um, hundreds to thousands. Hundreds yeah. to thousands. So this, we can have a reasonably soon, what you're saying, right? We yeah, if the technology continues to, to, to advance sort of exponentially then I think this, this would be... But again, it's, it's finding whether you can map it onto an algorithm that already yeah. exists is, is a difficult part. Algorithm, effectively finding the correct algorithm on the main problems. Yeah, yeah. I think if we had better quantum algorithms, it would speed up <coughs> the, our ability to use to use these systems. But designing a quantum system, though, mm -hmm. you don't actually need an algorithm. You have for modeling a quantum system. You yeah. can actually build it. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. Um, it's, I guess you have to find a way of, maybe not so much an algorithm, but you have to find a way of reading out the final state that, that works that works well. So, yeah, in your, in your protein folding problem, for example, you yeah. need to be able to... Uh, how about the idea of what, instead of reading out the state, you could use it to manipulate the state, so you could use it to construct the molecule from the output using quantum processes, and then just use that, say, a DNA template, like that. Yeah, yeah. That might be, you know, a different way of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the speed of the logic gates from quantum computers compared to traditional logic gates? Um, well, theoretically, they can actually go much faster. But to do the um, the entire cycle of kind of setting it into the superposition and then letting the superposition evolve and then reading it out mm -hmm. probably is certainly not as fast as current logic. Um, it's somewhere in the region of nanoseconds to microseconds at the moment per clock cycle so it, that that is something that can be improved upon with with advances in technology i think right now we're just really in yeah yeah question at the back um yeah is there a relationship between the, the number of qubits and decoherence time yes that, uh, it, it, it decreases as we increase the number of qubits yeah and yeah what, what's the relationship there? The, well, the relationship comes from the fact that as you get more qubits, they are closer to the en other things in the environment and they're more, more likely to interact. But it's, um, it's not exponential. No. <coughs> no. Well, well, it, well, if it was exponential, it would counteract exponential speed. Yes, yeah. I mean, well, that, that was a question I was going to ask. Yeah, the, um, the two things are linked, but the, de the decoherence time is not. It's not something that's intrinsic to the qubit, so it's not like if you had four qubits, the decoherence time would be four times less. It's the fact that having four qubits means it's more likely to, it has like four times the area, and then that's more likely to have um, a magnetic field is more likely to affect it. So if we can find ways of isolating these systems and shielding them better, 
then those four qubits 